Welcome to this uh, mini course on uh, two important uh, platforms in the EC2 service of AWS, the load balancer and the auto scaling group. These uh, platforms are important because they help us with uh, availability, scalability uh, and they help us achieve these uh, goals at low cost. Uh, remember folks that uh, today uh, most people are familiar with uh, Facebook, uh, they are familiar with uh, Google. Uh, who have um, done a fantastic job with availability and scalability, right? And as a result, uh, your users, uh, users of your application or service will expect your application to work in the same uh, way. Also, uh, remember that uh, in the past, availability and scalability used to be difficult to achieve. And also used to be expensive to implement but uh, with the uh, EC2 load balancer and the auto scaling group these are much simpler and uh, also quite uh, cost effective uh, and therefore accessible to anybody. So if you are going to build applications on top of AWS you must learn about the load balancer and the auto scaling group. Remember that uh, these have uh, many applications you can use them for uh, uh, web servers uh, for, for the web server layer you can use them for the app server layer you can use them for both uh, in the same architecture. Uh, you can also implement other types of layers. Um, uh, for example, you might uh, implement uh, an authentication microservice using these uh, platforms uh, or maybe a billing microservice um, or a search engine layer in your architecture could be implemented using these platforms as well. Right. So these are very important uh, uh, platforms. Okay, so now uh, what are we going to learn in this uh, course? In this course, we will learn how to get started with these platforms so we'll understand uh, you know why we use them uh, and also how to implement them um, and um, uh, getting started is important because once you do that right once you start uh, experimenting with these and you start using them uh, in your applications you tend to learn the advanced aspects on your uh, on your own now the course has been designed for AWS beginners right uh, but I have assumed some familiarity with uh, AWS and uh, especially the EC2, uh, EC2 uh, service. Um, we'll also be using uh, Linux servers and a simple PHP application, but you don't need to have any Linux or PHP skills uh, in this course. The only uh, prerequisite is that you must have an AWS account uh, so that you can provision these uh, resources and practice uh, uh, practice the practical aspects of this uh, course um, and um, finally remember that uh, we'll do this in four parts right we'll do this uh, course in four parts uh, the first part is uh, sort of a conceptual uh, part where we will understand uh, why we use the uh, these platforms uh, basically we'll understand how these help us achieve availability scalability at low cost uh, the other three parts are implementation parts and um, in part two we will see how to implement the load balancer. So I will show this to you and then you can try it on your own. Uh, in part three, we will implement the auto scaling group behind the load balancer. And once we do that, we will be able to test our application to see if our setup is correctly configured. And in the final part, we will do something fun, which is uh, we will look at scaling the auto scaling group, right? And by scaling, we mean uh, scale out which is adding more servers so that we can meet the additional demand and um, also scale in which is the opposite operation and here uh, basically we remove servers so that we can lower the cost of our infrastructure right so both scale out and scale in um, and we will look at three different ways of uh, doing this uh, one manual scaling two scaling using scheduled policies and three, scaling using automatic or dynamic policies as well. Okay, so that's that's the course. In summary, uh, the course will help you get started with the load balancer and the auto scaling group, two important platforms in the EC2 service of AWS. Uh, these platforms help us achieve availability and scalability at low cost. So uh, I look forward to your participation in this course. So why load balance? Well, we load balance because we want to have high availability, right? Basically, we want to have our application uh, to be up uh, always, just like Facebook or Google. Now, to understand how the load balancer helps us achieve high availability, 
we need to start by looking at the servers that are running behind the load balancer. And um, uh, we have three scenarios here, um, you know, a single server, uh, two servers, or three servers, right? And what we don't want to do is have a single server because if the server fails, right, the application becomes unavailable. Uh, we want to have multiple servers. So uh, if you look at, um, at this scenario where we have two servers, um, and note that um, each server here is half the capacity of the original server. So uh, overall, the capacity is the same, right? And the cost of the infrastructure is the same. But um, having two servers is better because um, when this server fails, let us say, we still have this one and um, therefore our application stays up. Right. Now, remember that you have to think about the capacity a bit here and the capacity utilization a bit here. So, uh, for example, if you had a 50% average utilization on both the servers, right, and um, if this server failed, the first one, um, and if you had a way of transferring this uh, load on the failed server to the healthy server, right, things would work uh, well, uh, things would work normally because the healthy server has enough room right it has enough capacity to take on the uh, load of the failed server right so as long as you plan your capacity uh, properly uh, having two servers uh, is better than having one uh, server now if you look at uh, this scenario where we have three servers right and um, overall the capacity is the same uh, because each server here is a third of the original server uh, so the cost of this infrastructure is the same um, but here things are even better because um, let's say uh, this server fails, uh, then we lose only one third the capacity, right? We still have uh, two servers uh, which are healthy. And um, here uh, we also want a way to transfer this load, right? So let's say uh, half of this load goes to this server and then the remaining half, let's say uh, this area here in green goes to the other server. Uh, but what happens is um, in the remaining servers, uh, we uh, we still have enough room, right? So so uh, once the load is transferred to these remaining servers, the remaining servers have enough room uh, to take on any additional traffic that might hit the server. So actually, uh, if you think about it, uh, 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 three servers is better than two, and two servers is better than one, right? So this is uh, something we want to do uh, to achieve high availability. Now, uh, note that in AWS, in addition to using multiple uh, servers, we also want to use multiple availability zones, right? So remember, uh, in AWS, every server comes up in a availability zone, right? So let's say this server, uh, the original server uh, is in a zone, let's call it zone A, right? Now, if you have two servers, it never makes sense to keep the two servers in the same zone, right? So it makes sense to kind of um, uh, set up this server in one zone, let's say zone A, right? And, um, and uh, this server here, the second server, should never be in zone A, right? It should always be in a different zone, let's say zone B, right? And the reason we do this is because each zone in a region is designed to be independent of the other zones, right? Um, in the sense that each zone has its own power supply, its own internet um, uh, service providers or internet connections um, there's also physical distance between the zones so that uh, you know if there's uh, a fire uh, kind of situation uh, uh, other zones are not affected right so this is um, uh, something we want to do because if a zone fails right if the whole zone fails uh, then uh, at the same time the other zone will likely not fail right that's how it has been architected so uh, so uh, similarly in the case of uh, three servers what we want to do is uh, we want to have uh, these three servers in three different zones, right? Something like this. Um, note that not all regions have three zones, but um, uh, if you do, right, and you, you want to use three servers, then it's better to distribute the servers in three different zones, something like this, okay? All right, so, so that's what we want to do. We want to use uh, multiple servers. We want to use uh, multiple availability zones, and this gives us high availability right now uh, there's a problem here right and the problem is that uh, we don't have a way of distributing the uh, requests from our users let's say you have some uh, users here uh, and, um, and the users don't know how to distribute the request to these multiple servers right so what we want to have 
uh, is uh, some kind of a component, some kind of a single point of contact in the middle. And uh, this, of course, is the load balancer, right? And um, the user request would come into the load balancer, right? So it's a single point of contact. Um, and uh, the load balancer would then uh, distribute the request to the servers that are running behind it. Okay, this is uh, 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 the function, the main function of the load balancer. Now, remember that the load balancer must distribute the traffic evenly, right, to the servers running behind it, because uh, if it did not do that, then one server could get overloaded, the users on that server would be affected, right, and the other server would not be fully utilized. So it has to be, it has to distribute um, the requests evenly. It also needs to be smart enough to detect failures, right? So let's say uh, if um, you know, this server has failed or the zone has failed, then the load balancer needs to detect that and then uh, start rebalancing. Basically, it needs to move the users um, away from the failed server uh, to the healthy server, right? Um, in this case, where we have three servers, uh, it needs to move the users away from the failed server to the two remaining servers, something like this. Right? So this is the function of the load balancer. Uh, in summary, uh, right, the load balancer uh, basically uh, helps us achieve high availability because it allows us to use multiple servers and multiple availability zones. It acts as a single point of contact. It receives all the requests and then distributes and then redistributes the load across all the available servers and zones. Okay, all right. So in the next video, let us understand why we want to use auto scaling. All right, so in this uh, video, let's understand why we use auto scaling groups. And uh, let's do this in two parts. First, let's understand why we need to scale, why we need scalability, and then we'll understand uh, why we need to do auto scaling, right? Okay, so what you're seeing on the uh, screen are two uh, diagrams. The one on the left is a, a demand, is a chart which has a demand curve. And let's say this is the uh, demand or the load on your infrastructure. Um, and on the right side, you have the uh, now hopefully familiar architecture where we have a load balancer and we have two uh, servers. And uh, these two servers are in uh, two availability zones, right? And we know that uh, when we use multiple servers, and multiple zones, we have high availability. But um, uh, actually, that's not always uh, true uh, because uh, the capacity that we have is a fixed um, uh, capacity. And what may happen, uh, for instance, is um, let's say your capacity is, uh, is at this uh, level, right? So this red line that I'm drawing here, let's say, is the uh, capacity which, uh, which you have at the moment. Uh, and um, when you have this capacity, uh, the, the capacity is sufficient for most of the time until you hit this point here, right? So, so over here, the demand uh, starts to exceed the capacity and uh, between these two points and then okay, once again between uh, these two points, your demand exceeds the capacity and uh, during these periods, your um, application may be uh, slow and uh, uh, sometimes may crash and uh, you will end up with some sort of an outage, right? So uh, the key point here is that um, having multiple servers and multiple zones is good, but not sufficient. And uh, we need to do something about the uh, capacity that we have in our infrastructure. Right, so how do we solve this problem where uh, sometimes the demand may exceed the capacity and we end up with uh, poor performance or um, an outage? So what we can do, and this is uh, what we used to do before cloud computing, is to simply have capacity higher than the peak demand, something like this. Right, And um, if you do that, uh, and th that's assuming that uh, you can uh, predict the the peak demand, right? And uh, and uh, often you may be able to do that. Uh, often the usage patterns are known, and uh, you may be able to predict the uh, the peak capacity, uh, peak demand, right? And um, so um, if you set up your capacity in this way, uh, then there's no point in time when uh, the demand exceeds the capacity and you have no outage, and that's a good thing. However. Uh, when we do that, we create a different kind of a problem. And what happens is the utilization of your infrastructure becomes very low because uh, you have so much capacity. And um, um, uh, in these uh, points in time, uh, when the demand is not as high, uh, you don't use the capacity uh, too much. And uh, this shaded area that I'm uh, uh, 
are highlighting here uh, is the extent to which your capacity is uh, underutilized, right? So, uh, so all this uh, space here that you see is um, the underutilization of your infrastructure, and uh, that um, is uh, very important because uh, this is an economic uh, problem, right? You have an asset, and you don't use that, so you don't get the return on investment on these assets okay so basically we have a we have a different kind of a problem here um, uh, if the uh, capacity is uh, too low we have an outage but here uh, if the capacity is too high then we have a cost problem or an economic problem right so what we uh, then uh, need to do and and, um, and uh, thanks to cloud computing uh, we can do is uh, to um, move the capacity up and down Right. Uh, or uh, uh, so. So, if I were to draw this out, uh, what we would uh, want to do ideally is um, not have a fixed uh, capacity, but uh, basically uh, have a capacity at a low level at this stage. Let's say, right, something like this. But then, when we need more capacity, uh, we should be able to increase uh, the capacity something like this, right? And uh, and then maybe at this point here. Uh, you can bring down the uh, capacity once again. Okay, so so um, yeah, this is what we want to do. Where um, uh, you know when we have high demand, we increase the capacity, and then when we have low demand, we decrease the capacity. Right, and and this is possible in cloud computing uh, because um, uh, as you know, uh, EC2 is uh, elastic; it's flexible. Uh, you can um, increase the uh, capacity of uh, a server. Uh, you can have more servers uh, and also you can decrease the capacity of a server and you can have less servers um, uh, quite easily right so uh, what we want to do uh, to solve this problem is to have scalability where uh, we have low capacity sometimes we have high capacity sometimes and when we do that you can see uh, the shaded area that i showed you earlier right uh, this is the extent of underutilization of the capacity uh, you can now see uh, the area has reduced uh, quite a bit right so your uh, utilization is now higher uh, your um, uh, cost uh, is uh, lower uh, simply because you are able to uh, change the capacity adjust the capacity right uh, and this is something that uh, we can easily do in cloud computing now uh, remember uh, this kind of adjustment of capacity you can do in multiple uh, ways um, in um, uh, ec2 for example it is possible to do vertical scaling where you increase the size of a server right um, and then when you uh, don't need that additional capacity you can uh, reduce the size of a server um, and this is called uh, scale uh, up or scale down uh, or vertical scaling right uh, you can do that but uh, normally we don't want to do that because uh, when you uh, change the uh, server uh, type you need a reboot or a restart and that causes an outage so so normally what we want to do uh, is uh, do horizontal scaling right we want to add more servers so so something like this let's say you need more capacity um, so you would add two servers let's say um, at this point here right um, in the chart you need more capacity so you could add two servers uh, one in each zone that you have right so this is called uh, horizontal scaling where we are increasing the number of servers right and uh, that's what we normally want to uh, do and then at this point here right at this point here uh, where you don't need more capacity you can uh, do uh, the opposite action this is called scale in right so when you add more servers it's called scale out and when you remove servers it's called scale in and here you can uh, terminate uh, two of these servers and you're back to uh, a lower capacity okay so when we do uh, scaling, especially using auto scaling groups, we mean horizontal scaling where we simply add more servers or we remove servers. And, um, and by doing that, we can achieve this kind of uh, capacity curve. Uh, and uh, as you can see in the chart, this is much more cost efficient. Right, so now that we know uh, why we need scalability, uh, essentially, 
uh, uh, we need that because uh, we can increase the capacity when the demand goes up and uh, decrease the capacity when the demand goes down so that our infrastructure is more cost efficient right so we understand that but uh, why do we need uh, auto scaling let's take a look at that now so yeah, one of the reasons we need uh, auto scaling uh, is um, uh, the unpredictability of uh, demand right so so this uh, peak uh, uh, demand here uh, uh, right, uh, we may not know uh, when this will occur. Right, so so if you don't know when this will occur, then it's hard to uh, ensure capacity is available uh, at this time. Because uh, you know, even if you had someone watching uh, the demand very carefully, uh, by the time the person reacts, it may be too late, and and your application may already be uh, down. Right, so uh, if the uh, if the uh, peaks are unpredictable, then it's hard to do manual scaling, right? And um, also remember that uh, these uh, peaks may happen at a high uh, frequency, right? And uh, they may happen um, very often, right? So uh, once again, when, when you need to adjust capacity frequently, uh, it's hard to do it uh, manually, okay? These are a couple of reasons why uh, we uh, want to do auto uh, scaling where uh, our servers here are added automatically uh, and uh, and they also removed automatically when the demand subsides, right? Okay, but uh, I think um, one of the uh, more important reasons uh, is that uh, when we do auto scaling, it's possible to adjust the capacity very, very frequently, right? In small increments. So, so if you look at this demand curve, um, uh, what if you could do uh, something like this where uh, let's say the black line here is the capacity okay so you could uh, increase the capacity over here and then over here you could decrease the capacity and notice how small the increments are right and how small the decrements are as well okay so so with auto scaling because uh, the scale out and scale in is happening automatically uh, right it can happen uh, quite frequently and it can happen in small increments which means uh, the server sizes that we have should be very small okay that's one reason why uh, in our auto scaling groups we should always try and use the smallest possible server right but um, if the capacity can be adjusted in this fashion right uh, in this fashion uh, so you can see that um, when you do that the gap between the capacity and the demand curve is very small right so uh, uh, essentially if you were to draw a, a smooth line uh, your capacity may look something like this right something like this um, and um, and notice that the gap between the demand and the uh, capacity curve is very small and um, that yellow shaded area that we discussed earlier right uh, would be something like this and uh, this is very small uh, which means your capacity utilization is quite high and therefore your cost of infrastructure is quite high right so this is another reason another very important reason why we want to do auto scaling okay so 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 uh, you know auto scaling helps us uh, with the unpredictable demand uh, with frequently changing demand and uh, it also helps us to optimize the cost to a very significant uh, extent. In this video, let's take a look at how to implement a load balancer. And let's start by looking at what the prerequisites are uh, for the load balancer. All right. So remember that, first of all, the load balancer has to come up um, inside of a VPC, right? So let me just draw uh, uh, this over here, and let's say this is our uh, virtual private cloud, which is a, a private uh, network, and uh, the load balancer must be provis provisioned inside of this uh, virtual private uh, cloud, right? So, so let's say this is our uh, load balancer here, and this should be inside of the uh, VPC, and later we will see the servers as well. The uh, servers in our auto scaling group will be inside of the VPC uh, as well, right? So that's uh, prerequisite uh, number uh, one. Now, the load balancer also needs a security group, right? So let me just draw the circle around the load balancer. And uh, this is uh, uh, a security group, which is essentially a firewall, right? So this is a firewall, and every load balancer must have a firewall or a security group right remember that the user requests let's say we have a user here and the user 
uh, request comes in to the load balancer uh, this request will be coming in over the HTTP protocol uh, using the port uh, number 80 right so we need to make sure that the port 80 uh, for HTTP protocol is open in this security group right so that's the third prerequisite also the load balancer needs to have what is called a target group right so this target group is a configuration um, and it refers to a group of targets right and the targets are basically the servers right so we won't create our servers in this module in this part of the course uh, we'll do that later but let me just draw these two boxes here to signify the servers that we will have at, at some point in this uh, in this course right and the servers are the targets and the target group is uh, refers to a group of targets that the load balancer will distribute requests to in this fashion okay so target groups uh, the load balancer must have at least one target group and uh, that's uh, also a prerequisite okay remember by the way that um, the load balancer uh, uses a health check to determine the health of instances so that it can rebalance the load if, a, if an instance fails right and um, uh, along with the target group we will create a health check as well okay so these are uh, the pre uh, requisites all right so now that we have seen what the uh, the prerequisites are let's take a look at uh, uh, how do we provision the load balancer right and uh, here in this step we basically uh, go through a few configuration uh, steps and uh, we configure uh, these prerequisites uh, that we spoke about uh, along with a few other uh, aspects as well so uh, remember you you know you basically configure the VPC right this is the default uh, VPC that we spoke about earlier uh, we will also configure the default security group the one that has our uh, rule uh, that allows inbound access on port 80. Uh, we will also configure the target group that we spoke about earlier. Uh, this is the group that will have our servers uh, at some point uh, later. And um, uh, the other aspects uh, that we want to configure are uh, things like the availability zones in which our servers would be would be running in. Right. So remember, uh, when we create an architecture like this, we always uh, want to have our servers in multiple zones right so so this server uh, could be in zone a let's say and uh, this server here could be in zone b uh, so we need to tell the load balancer that uh, uh, you know our servers will be in these two zones and you should expect them uh, in these two zones okay so this is how we uh, configure the load balancer uh, when we are provisioning it uh, and uh, then uh, we wait so it takes a bit of time maybe a few minutes or so um, uh, before the before the load balancer uh, moves into an active state and is ready for uh, use right and once uh, it is ready for use we can test the load balancer right and the way we do that is by using its uh, DNS uh, endpoint right so the load balancer is a platform it's not a single server so it doesn't have an IP address uh, instead what it has is a DNS endpoint right and uh, this is uh, uh, something that we can copy and uh, use it in our browser and that's how the uh, user's request would end up on the load balancer right so we'll do that we'll test the dns endpoint see what happens uh, also note that in a real project your domain right let's say www your uh, product.com uh, would point to the dns endpoint and this is how your users would end up on the load balancer okay all right so so these are the key steps um, uh, we need to to do to implement the load balancer one set up the prerequisites like the VPC uh, two provision the load balancer configure things like the security group and the target group and uh, uh, three uh, wait for the load balancer to be to be active and then test it using its DNS endpoint okay so in the next part of this uh, video let's uh, implement these three steps using the AWS management console Alright, so let's take a look at how to uh, provision the load balancer using the management console and let me switch over to the uh, to my uh, management console, right, and uh, um, we go into the EC2 service because uh, remember 
the load balancer and the autoscaling group are uh, both sort of platforms uh, within the broader uh, EC2 uh, service here, right? So from the EC2 dashboard, uh, the first thing we do is uh, look at, at our security group, right? And uh, uh, this is the default security group, which is part of the default VPC as well. And what we need to do first is go into the inbound uh, rules tab here. And uh, here we create a new uh, rule uh, which will allow access on port 80, right? The HTTP protocol uh, and the port 80. Uh, and uh, this will allow access from anywhere, right? So, so this here uh, means uh, that uh, any IP address, okay, so this. Uh, uh, this highlighted bit that you see here uh, refers to IPv4 addresses and uh, it means that any IPv4 address anywhere in the world will be able to connect to this load balancer uh, on the HTTP protocol and on port 80, right? And the second bit here uh, refers to IPv6 addresses because remember uh, the networks all over the world are moving to IPv6, right? Uh, uh, IPv4 addresses um, um, the world is running out of uh, public IPv4 addresses, there's migration going on uh, to IPv6 addresses, uh, but uh, this rule here allows uh, both uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and any IP address uh, will be allowed to access the load balancer. Okay, so that's our uh, uh, inbound rule that we needed to create in our security uh, group, right? Next, we take care of the target group, which is also our um, a prerequisite for the load balancer. And um, what we do is uh, create a group, uh, let's, let's call it, uh, say, my TG, uh, and we choose the VPC, right? And this is the default VPC. Uh, you know, we don't have to change anything, but uh, just note that uh, we're creating this target group uh, and we're configuring this uh, with our default VPC, right? By the way, uh, the health check uh, that we've discussed earlier in this course, uh, and uh, which is an important function of the load balancer, is configured at a target group uh, level. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, uh, the default configuration for the health check, right? For instance, um, the health check uh, essentially is a sort of a ping that the load balancer does on each of the instances in the target group, right? And uh, what's, what's happening here is that uh, the load balancer will uh, send this uh, ping using the HTTP protocol here, and it'll send it to this path, which is the home uh, uh, the home uh, page of the uh, application, right? You can change the path if you like, but uh, but usually uh, the default, uh, the home page is fine. And uh, below that, uh, in the advanced uh, settings, you can see uh, how the health check will work, right? Essentially, uh, the health check runs uh, every 30 seconds. That's the interval that you see here. And um, it expects a response back from the server. Each server has to respond um, uh, back to the load balancer and uh, the uh, load balancer expects an HTTP 200 uh, code in the response, right? And um, if the if a particular server is not uh, healthy, um, uh, then the load balancer will uh, attempt the health check uh, twice, right? This is the unhealthy threshold. And if the server, uh, a particular server, fails the health check twice in a row, then the load balancer would uh, mark that server as unhealthy and would stop sending new requests to that server and would rebalance the load, uh, uh, you know, in the remaining servers that are available. Okay, so that's the health check uh, uh, configuration here. You can fine tune this, uh, this configuration if you like, but the default uh, configuration is fine as well. I'm not gonna change that. Okay, so this is how we create our target uh, group. Uh, and uh, these are the main prerequisites for our load balancer, right? Next, let's see how to provision the load balancer. All right, so what we've seen so far is uh, how do we set up the prerequisites for the load balancer, right? Now, let's take a look at how to provision the load balancer. Uh, we go back to the management console and uh, uh, essentially we look for the load balancer's uh, page here in the EC2 uh, console, right? And uh, we use this button, create load balancer, and uh, this opens up um, uh, the configuration uh, steps here. And uh, the first step that we do is uh, choose the application load balancer. Okay, this is uh, sort of a newer load balancer. And uh, most uh, for most uh, use cases, this is the one that uh, applies, right? So let's uh, select 
uh, the application load balancer. Uh, then we, you know, uh, give this a name. Let's call it uh, my load balancer. Uh, you can leave most of these um, uh, fields at uh, default uh, values. Uh, for example, uh, you know, is it uh, this is an internet-facing load balancer because because uh, you know we expect the users to hit the load balancer directly, right? Uh, via the internet, so that's fine. Uh, the listener uh, right now. We have a HTTP listener later. Uh, you can consider using HTTPS listeners as well, but uh, that's uh, beyond the scope of uh, this course. Let's leave it uh, uh, at this default value. And um, here, um, in this third uh, section here, uh, we choose our VPC. Right? This is the default uh, VPC that we've spoken about earlier. And the key thing to do here is to select the availability zones uh, in which we expect our servers to be Right, so so let's say uh, later when we create our auto scaling group, uh, those servers in that group will run in zones A and B. Right, so so we choose these two zones, uh, and essentially we are telling the load balancer that uh, here's where uh, the servers will be present. Okay, so so this is an important step here. All right, next we uh, configure the security group. Right, we don't have to create a new security group. We simply use the default one, and remember this is the one that has our uh, inbound rule uh, allowing access on port 80, uh, the HTTP port. All right, um, by the way, when you're provisioning the load balancer, uh, you can create the target group uh, um, as part of this uh, uh, this uh, uh, provisioning as well, but uh, we have already done that, right? So we can skip this uh, step, uh, or, or rather, you know, we can choose uh, our uh, target group that we created earlier here, right? So we say uh, uh, it's an existing group, and then we choose our uh, uh, my TG group which we had created earlier okay so so, th so that's uh, uh, linking up the load balancer with this particular target group and uh, in the next step uh, if you like you can register targets right and uh, uh, what we mean by register targets is uh, we connect servers to the target group right but right now we don't have any servers so we'll have to skip this step but uh, remember that um, essentially the auto scaling group that we set up in the next part of this course uh, will have to be linked to the target group right and that's how uh, the load balancer knows about the servers that it needs to distribute to but right now we skip this particular step all right so here's our uh, review page and uh, essentially we are creating a load balancer uh, which is listening on port 80 um, it uses the default VPC, right? And uh, it is configured to uh, look for servers in zones A and uh, B, right? That's the selection here. Then we choose the subnetworks uh, of the VPC. We also choose the availability zones uh, in which those subnets are uh, set up, right? And um, uh, this is the uh, configuration of the security group, the default security uh, group here. And uh, also, uh, this is the configuration of the target group that we had created in the in an earlier step. Okay. All right. So this is our load balancer. Let me create on the. Let me click on this uh, create uh, button here, and um, uh, uh, we will have to wait. Right. So so the load balancer uh, will need a few minutes maybe. So note that uh, the load balancer here is in a provisioning uh, state. Right. And this will uh, uh, change to an active state in a couple of minutes. And uh, once it does that, uh, we uh, should be able to test the load balancer, right? So, so what we do when we're testing the load balancer is uh, essentially uh, use this uh, DNS uh, name that you see highlighted over here, right? So, so basically, you can copy this uh, DNS name uh, like this, right? And then you can open up a new tab here and, um, and uh, uh, test the uh, DNS name uh, in your browser's address bar, right? And right now you can see, you know, uh, it says site can't be reached, uh, perhaps because the load balancer is not yet provisioned, right? But um, uh, you can try this yourself uh, after the uh, load balancer state is active, right? Try the try the DNS endpoint uh, once again and uh, check out what you uh, see and try and understand why uh, you see what you see. Okay, all right. So I'll I'll uh, end this video over here. Uh, basically, I've shown you uh, how to uh, how to uh, provision the uh, load balancer uh, after the prerequisites have been set up, right? And remember, when we provision the load balancer, we configure things like the VPC, the security group, the target group, the availability zones. And I've also shown you how to identify and use the DNS endpoint in your browser so that you can test your load balancer.
Okay, all right, so that's um, the end of this uh, particular module. In the next module, let's see how to set up the auto scaling group. All right, so in this uh, module, let's see how to implement an auto scaling group. And uh, in this first video, in this module, let's discuss uh, the key steps, right? So, so remember, the auto scaling group uh, will come up in the same uh, VPC, right? So this is our VPC where we have our load balancer. And um, let's say this box here is our auto scaling group, right? And uh, um, let's say to start with, we will have two servers in our group, right? So let me just label this. Uh, this is the auto scaling group which we want to create. Now the way we do this is uh, first we need to create what is called a launch configuration, right? The launch configuration is a, is a template um, where we define what kind of servers we want in the auto scaling group, right? Um, uh, remember that all these servers in the group are clones and they share certain properties and those properties are defined in the launch configuration. For instance, we define the army, Amazon machine image, right? This is the, uh, the machine image is a template for the operating system or any kind of software that you want installed on these servers when the servers come up, right? In our case, we will use the Ubuntu army uh, and we'll use the Ubuntu 18.04 version right in our launch configuration um, we also have to define the instance type and uh, it makes sense in general to use the t2 micro instance because these are free tier eligible uh, we'll also define a script and this is a bootstrap script which will install the apache web server and a simple hello world kind of application on the servers right so whenever a new server comes up uh, this bootstrap uh, script will run and will install the web server and the application. Okay, so this is something uh, we need to take care of uh, as well. And um, uh, we will define uh, the security group. Okay, the the security group is something that every server in the auto scaling group uh, must have. And uh, although we can define a separate uh, security group, in this course, what we will do is uh, use the same default security group that we have used for the load balancer. Right, so something like this. So we'll use the same uh, group. Uh, and uh, remember that this group has a rule which allows inbound access on port 80, right? And um, the reason we do this uh, is because it's uh, simpler. And um, uh, this particular group is set up in such a way that uh, if you were to use the same group uh, between, uh, you know, uh, for the load balancer and the auto scaling group, the communication between the load balancer and the servers would be allowed. Okay, that's how it is set up and therefore uh, it's uh, simpler to do it this way. Okay, this is um, the launch configuration. There are certain other aspects uh, as well that we will have to configure, but uh, these are uh, the four key things that we need to uh, uh, set up when we create the launch configuration, right? And once we have the launch configuration, uh, we have a template to create the auto scaling group, which will be the next step. All right, so once we have the launch configuration, we are ready to provision the auto scaling uh, group, right? And uh, what we do here is uh, we essentially start with the launch configuration, right? So, so when we are provisioning the auto scaling group, we have to uh, uh, specify uh, certain aspects, right? And the first thing we specify is what launch configuration we want to use because um, that configuration this stuff over here will define what kind of servers we have in the group, right? So, so we say this is the launch configuration we want to use. We also specify other uh, uh, aspects, for example, the VPC, right? So we want to use the same default VPC uh, that we've used for the load balancer and we need to configure that when we are provisioning the auto scaling uh, group. We also define the availability zones that we want to use. Remember when we set up our target uh, group, we um, defined zones A and B, right? When we set up a load balancer, I'm sorry, we defined zones A and B as the zones in which we will set up our servers, right? So we need to be consistent here. And uh, that's why when we, when we provision our auto scaling group, we will define the same two zones, A and B uh, here as well. Right. Um, also, uh, one very important configuration 
that we do at this stage is to define what is called the desired capacity. Right? So the desired capacity uh, tells the auto scaling group how many servers should be created. Right? And initially we can start with uh, two and, uh, and later in the next module you will see how you can change the desired capacity when you need to scale out or scale in the auto scaling group. Okay, so this is how we provision uh, the auto scaling uh, group. Remember, the main thing is we need to have a launch configuration first, and then we use that launch configuration to provision the auto scaling group itself. All right, so we have provisioned our auto scaling group, and um, uh, it takes a bit of time, but uh, the group gets uh, provisioned, and then uh, and then we have two uh, EC2 instances in two different zones, A and B, that are available, right? So remember, uh, these two servers will have uh, uh, the Ubuntu operating system, okay? The Ubuntu operating system, because that's what we uh, defined in the launch configuration. Uh, these two servers will be T2 micro instances, because that's what we defined in the launch configuration, once again. And uh, also remember that these two servers will have the Apache uh, web server right and a simple HTML app called app.html okay this this uh, web server and application is installed uh, by the script uh, which by the way is available uh, in your course notes um, and uh, this script is something we set up in the launch configuration as well okay so so once the auto scaling group is provisioned uh, we have two servers uh, uh, with these properties right now uh, that's good but this is not uh, enough and uh, what we need to do next is uh, connect the load balancer with these servers at this time the load balancer is not aware of these servers in the auto scaling group right and what we need to do is we need to configure the target group uh, with the auto scaling group remember uh, from our previous module we have something called a target group, right? This blue box here, uh, which we created along with the health check uh, and the load balancer in the previous module, right? So this target group uh, is something we need to configure in the auto scaling group, right? And when we do that, the load balancer becomes aware of the auto scaling group servers and is ready becomes ready to distribute our requests to the auto scaling group. Okay, so this is a, a key step that we need to do next. All right, so the final step, uh, once we have um, provisioned the auto scaling group and uh, we've connected it to the load balancer via the target group is to simply test our application, right? So what we want to do now um, is uh, essentially go to this URL, which is uh, HTTP, the load balancer's DNS name, slash app.html, right? This app is what uh, this script over here, uh, which we set up in our launch configuration, has deployed on each of these two servers in the auto scaling group, right? And um, we go to the load balancer's DNS name this way, Right? And the load balancer will then forward our requests to one of the two servers, right? And we get a response. Uh, and uh, if the if everything is configured correctly, uh, we will see a hello world page in our browsers. Right? This means uh, the configuration has been correctly done. Now, by the way, if you refresh your page, the load balancer will send the second request to the second server, right? And you'll get the same uh, page, the same response but this time from the second server, okay? So you can try this, uh, try it once, try it uh, uh, twice, try it uh, thrice. You'll see the same Hello World page, uh, but uh, uh, you can be sure that the load balancer is switching you from one server to the other. Uh, essentially, it does a simple round robin sort of routing between the two servers that are there in the auto scaling group, okay? All right, so this is how we uh, uh, implement the auto scaling group. Uh, uh, essentially, first, we set up the launch uh, configuration. This is a template which defines what kind of servers we will have in the auto scaling group. The second step is to provision the group uh, using the launch configuration, but we also specify other uh, things like uh, what zones we want to use, what's the desired capacity uh, that we want to have, uh, and which VPC uh, to use. 
and uh, uh, the third step is important this is where we connect the load balancer and the auto scaling group so that the load balancer is able to uh, find these servers and distribute the requests to these servers and the last step of course is to test the application uh, to verify that our, our configuration the whole configuration uh, and setup is done correctly okay so in the next video let's uh, uh, use the management console and implement these four steps all right so uh, in this video, let's uh, implement uh, these uh, four uh, steps, um, uh, provision our auto scaling group, uh, configure it with the target uh, group and uh, finally test our application via the load balancer. Okay, so let me uh, switch over to the browser and uh, to the EC2 dashboard in the AWS management console. And here, let me find the auto scaling group section, which is just below the load balancing section in the menu to the left. Right. And um, here we need to go into the launch configurations page um, and use this button create launch configuration to start the process of uh, creating the launch configuration. And the first step here, of course, is to use is to set up or, or, or rather choose the army, the Amazon machine image. And um, I'm going to choose Ubuntu 18.04. Uh, you should do the same because the script that we use in this course and the other steps, uh, verification steps, have been tested on this particular army, right? So don't worry, you don't need to know Ubuntu or Linux, uh, right? Uh, just make sure that you choose this particular army uh, in this uh, step. Okay, in the second step, we choose the instance type, right? All servers in the group are exactly the same. So when we say T2 Micro, let's say, you should choose T2 Micro because uh, these servers are free tier eligible. Uh, all the servers in the group will be T2 micro instances. Okay, so we, we choose this particular uh, server type. In the third step, we specify a name. You can give this launch configuration any name for the moment, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the key thing to do is to go into this advanced details uh, section and under the user data field, uh, you need to uh, paste the script. Uh, and the script is available with your uh, notes course notes under this module, right? So just copy the script uh, from your course notes and paste the script over here like this. And what the script does is that it runs only once when the server first boots and um, it installs the Apache web server first and then it deploys a very simple hello world HTML page under the Apache document root, right? So this uh, script is something we set up in the launch configuration uh, in this course so that we can test the application via the load balancer and verify that our uh, uh, setup, the configuration, the architecture has been correctly done. Okay, so this is a very important step. Uh, and uh, then we go to the next um, um, step here. Um, this is storage, uh, we don't have to do anything here. Just note that this is the EBS volume, elastic block store volume uh, that um, uh, will be created for each server in the auto scaling group. Uh, this is the root volume and this volume will contain the Ubuntu 18.04 operating system and later uh, also contain the Apache web server and the application as well. Okay, uh, uh, in the next step, we configure the security group. This is, um, uh, you know, like we discussed, we will not create a new one instead use the default security group, the same group that we used for the load balancer as well. And uh, note that this group has this rule here, the second rule that you see. Uh, and this rule basically means that the load balancer will be able to talk to the auto scaling group servers without any problem. Okay, it's okay if you don't understand this rule very well at this uh, point. Just note that uh, this rule, which is already there in the default security group is a reason the load balancer will be able to talk to the auto scaling group without any problem. Okay, so uh, that's it. We now look at the review page and what we're doing here is creating our launch configuration, right? And in the configuration, we are specifying Ubuntu 18.04 as the machine image, right? So the servers, all the servers in the auto scaling group will be Ubuntu 18.04. All the servers in the auto scaling group are clones, remember. And um, all these servers will also be T2 micro instances, right? You should choose this because this is free to your eligible. Remember that um, we have set up the user data field, right? This is very important because uh, the script in this field will install the Apache web server and set up our application so that we can test our architecture. And finally, note that 
under security group, we have selected the default security group. Okay, so now we can create the launch configuration, but uh, when, you, when you hit this button, note that there is one more step that has to be taken care of, and this is the SSH uh, key pair uh, used to connect to the servers uh, over the SSH protocol. Now, in this course, you don't need this. Okay, we don't need this because we're not connecting to the servers, but let me just go ahead and create a new key pair um, in any case, uh, and you might need to do this in a real project, right? So let me just uh, create a key pair, give this a name like this, download the private key in this fashion, and then I can create the launch configuration. Okay, now this launch configuration is just a configuration. Nothing really happens in terms of uh, 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 servers, right? No servers are created when we create the launch configuration. Um, uh, what we need to do next is to use this configuration to create our auto scaling group. All right, so in this video, let's take a look at how to provision the auto scaling group. Remember, in the previous video, we have seen how to create the launch configuration. The launch configuration has all the information required create the servers in the auto scaling group right now let's use the launch configuration uh, let me let me switch to the management console in the browser and we use this launch configuration here um, and we click on this button create auto scaling group right and um, uh, in this um, uh, process we have to configure the group so uh, you know we specify the name for example you can give this any name uh, you specify the desired capacity Okay, this field is very important. Uh, it says group size, but a better name would be desired capacity. And um, let's start with two servers, two instances, because when we want high availability, the minimum number of servers should always be two, right? So, so this is um, uh, two, and then we choose the VPC. Uh, this is our uh, default uh, VPC, the same VPC uh, that has our load balancer. Remember that the load balancer and the auto scaling group must always be in the same uh, virtual private uh, cloud, the same network, right? Also very important is to ensure that the same zones are used or, or are configured for both the load balancer and the auto scaling group, right? Uh, the load balancer, um, uh, remember in the previous module, we configured zones A and B, and it's very important to ensure that we configure the same two zones here, right? So, so we have zones A and B here as well. Uh, and uh, what this means is that the auto scaling group will launch these two instances, you know, the, the desired capacity is two. So the auto scaling group will create one server in zone A and another server in zone B. That's exactly how we want it because the load balancer expects the servers to be in these two zones. Okay, so this is uh, the key part of our configuration. All right, uh, in the next page, we can configure some scaling policies, but uh, we'll leave uh, scaling policies for the next module. In this module, we'll start with a fixed uh, uh, size for the auto scaling group. Therefore, we use this option at the moment. All right, the next two steps we can skip for the moment, right? These are about notifications and tagging. Um, both are important perhaps, but, uh, but in this beginner course, not so much. Let's skip those steps and let's take a look at the review page now. So basically, we are creating an auto scaling group using a launch configuration which we created earlier, right? And um, here, uh, most of the information required to create the servers are in the launch configuration already, right? But um, uh, here, we configure uh, other important things like the desired capacity. Okay, this field here says that the desired capacity is two. So what that what that what will happen now is that the auto scaling group will launch two servers for us, right? And um, also note that we have configured two zones when we choose the subnets of the VPC. We also choose the zones, and um, we have two zones here: zone one A and zone one B. Uh, and uh, that's an important uh, configuration because the load balancer is expecting the servers to be in these two zones. All right. Okay. So let's create our auto scaling group now. And here, when we do that, remember that uh, we are provisioning capacity, right? We are creating, uh, we are asking the auto scaling group to launch servers for us, right? And uh, notice that uh, the auto scaling group has a desired capacity, this one over here, which is two. And initially, the actual number of instances will be zero, obviously, because we've just created the uh, group here, but um, the auto scaling group is designed to always ensure in, in a steady state situation to always ensure 
that actual capacity is equal to the desired capacity, right? So if you refresh the page, right, notice that the actual number of instances now has become 2. Okay, that's because the desired capacity was 2, right? And, and the autoscaling group has, um, has actually gone ahead, launched two servers, and uh, notice, by the way, you can see the instances tab here, and uh, notice that the two servers have been created in two different zones, one server in zone 1A and the other server in zone 1B. And this is, um, um, you know, um, by design, uh, the autoscaling group is a smart component which knows that we get high availability uh, if the servers are distributed in multiple zones. Okay, all right. So you, you've seen um, in this uh, video how to provision an autoscaling uh, group. Essentially, we start with the launch configuration, right? And uh, during the provisioning process, we configure the VPC, we configure the two availability zones, right? Which should match the configuration of the load balancer. And then we also specify the desired capacity, which is two. And we've seen that the auto scaling group provisions the servers for us, right? We don't launch the servers. Uh, the auto scaling group does that. And um, it has indeed launched two servers and we verified that the two servers are in two different zones as they should be. Okay. All right. So in the next video, uh, let's take a look at uh, steps three and four, where we connect the load balancer to the auto scaling group uh, using the target group. And uh, after that, we test the application using the load balancer's DNS name. All right, so we have provisioned our auto scaling group. And now let's take a look at steps uh, three and four here. And uh, in step three, what we want to do is configure the target group uh, in the auto scaling group. And uh, by doing that, we connect the load balancer in the auto scaling group. And uh, the load balancer knows about the servers um, and uh, is uh, able to distribute the request to the servers, right? So once we do step three, we'll do step four, which is to test the application using the load balancer's DNS name, right? Let me show this to you. Um, here's our management console. And um, uh, it's very simple. All we have to do is uh, go into the auto scaling group uh, uh, that we have. And uh, from actions, edit the uh, auto scaling group's configuration, right? And uh, make sure that you uh, set up the target group. Remember, we have a target group called MyTG. So we just choose that in this uh, field here, target groups, right? And then we click on save. So that's it. Uh, this is how you uh, make the auto scaling group part of the target group and, and thereby connect the load balancer and the auto scaling group servers. Okay, so let me just uh, do this. And, um, and now what we can do to verify uh, the connection, right, is to go to the target groups uh, page here. And in our target group, MyTG, uh, let's look at the targets tab here, right? So this tab will show you a listing of the servers that are part of this target group, right? And you can see there are two servers right now. Um, uh, and these two servers are um, the servers which are which are part of a part of our auto scaling group. And um, notice, by the way, that initially the status uh, is initial. And what this means is that the two servers uh, are being registered. Okay, they are being registered as targets in the target group at the moment. Uh, and uh, very quickly, the status changes. And now you can see the status has changed to healthy. Okay, so so this means that the two auto scaling group servers that we have, have been successfully registered in our target group. And the load balancer will now start distributing the user request to these servers. Okay, all right, so that's done. Now it's time to test our application, test our entire architecture, in fact. So let me go back to the load balancer now, and let me find the load balancer's DNS name once again. So we uh, copy the uh, load balancer's uh, DNS name like this, right? And then uh, in our uh, browser window, let me just paste the uh, DNS name and um, add a slash and then say app.html. This app.html is the application that our um, uh, bootstrap uh, script in the launch configuration uh, uh, deploys on our servers, right? And you can see uh, when you go to this address, uh, you can, you can uh, the, the, the application, the HTML application responds with a simple hello world message. Uh, and this is expected. This is how 
uh, I would expect the application to work. Okay, so so um, uh, now what we've done is we've completed all these four steps here, starting with uh, uh, creating the launch configuration, uh, which is a template for the servers in the auto scaling group. Uh, second, we have provisioned the auto scaling group uh, with a desired capacity of two, uh, and uh, 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 third step, we have configured the target group in the auto scaling group thereby connecting the load balancer and the auto scaling group and finally we've tested the application here right and we've verified that the load balancer uh, uh, load balancer uh, is able to connect to the servers is able to distribute our request to the servers and we've successfully receiving responses uh, from the server from our application via the load balancer as well okay so this concludes this particular module of this course uh, and uh, now we have a complete architecture which is up and running in the next module we'll see how to scale the auto scaling group all right so in this module let's um, understand how to scale the auto scaling group uh, that we already have and uh, what we will do here is look at three different ways of scaling one scaling the group uh, manually uh, two scaling the group using scheduled policies and three uh, scaling using auto scaling policies right so three different ways and um, in this video i will explain to you uh, what these mean how to use these uh, different methods and uh, also when to use these different methods and um, in the next set of videos we'll um, uh, actually implement uh, these scaling methods mm -hmm. uh, using the aws management uh, console so let's look at uh, manual scaling and um, um, remember folks that we're using the auto scaling group but uh, that does not mean that we cannot scale the group manually in fact uh, manual scaling um, is important because um, it is a simple way of scaling uh, you're in control of um, when you scale and by how much you scale okay um, now uh, the main thing to understand is uh, uh, when to use manual scaling and um, to understand that let's look at this uh, chart here and um, you can see that um, the uh, demand, this orange curve here, is pretty steady uh, for most of the time. But um, at this time here, at this point, the demand uh, sort of increases. And um, uh, after some time, uh, at this point, it uh, sort of uh, subsides and we get back to our regular usage pattern, right? And um, let's say uh, this time period over here is known, right? We know. Uh, when this increase in demand occurs and uh, let's say we also know by how much right so 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 even this uh, bit this piece of information is known uh, and there are many such examples uh, for instance uh, let us say this is uh, a UAT environment and uh, on a certain day you need to do a performance uh, test so you would know that uh, on that day you would need more capacity and you, you know, probably also would know how, many, how much more capacity you would need because uh, you're in control of your performance test. Uh, you know how much you're going to load up the uh, load the system uh, uh, by. Um, another example could be the Thanksgiving holiday uh, where um, uh, on that one day uh, in a year, you, um, uh, if you're an online retailer like Amazon, uh, you know that you would need more capacity and uh, going by past experience, you would also know how many more servers you would need, right? So, so if it is predictable, if you know uh, in advance that you will need more capacity or less capacity, uh, and um, also um, uh, the frequency of, uh, of uh, this um, uh, situation should be uh, low, right? So, so remember, if uh, this kind of change in demand happens very frequently, then you can't really do manual scaling because um, you can't have someone sitting and watching um, or, or changing the capacity frequently, right? So, so these are two criteria um, under which you can do manual scaling. Okay, so how do we uh, do this? So what you have to do uh, is quite simple, really, and uh, you simply need to change the desired capacity, right? So desired capacity is a configuration which we saw when we set up the auto scaling group. Um, and um, what you do is uh, at this time, at this time here, you increase the desired capacity, let us say, uh, to 10 which is a higher number and then um, at the end of the period at this time you simply change the desired capacity once again and set it uh, to the uh, to a lower number uh, to the regular uh, capacity that you have right so let's say it's two servers here okay so that's it that's all we have to do and uh, remember we don't um, do anything to the actual capacity the actual capacity 
uh, is um, controlled by the auto scaling group uh, and uh, the auto scaling group is uh, uh, programmed to ensure at steady state that the actual uh, is equal to desired right so when we change the desired capacity uh, shortly after that uh, the auto scaling group will change the actual capacity and bring the two numbers in sync okay so this is how we do manual scaling all right so next uh, let's look at uh, scaling using scheduled policies so uh, here um, once again we first need to understand when to use uh, this kind of uh, method right and if you look at the chart uh, here uh, notice that uh, there's a certain regularity to the usage uh, pattern to the demand curve here right and um, uh, you can see uh, the demand uh, increases uh, let's say during uh, this uh, this time this period here uh, right and uh, then it subsides to a lower uh, level and then again uh, it, it increases uh, say during these uh, uh, this uh, period here and um, you could say I mean um, this is uh, 9 a.m. let's say and this is 5 p.m. right this is a typical uh, usage for many applications let's say business applications say a CRM system or a HR system and um, you know, these systems uh, are these applications are used in uh, say uh, your uh, workplaces and uh, most people around the world uh, work between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. right so so naturally you'll have uh, more demand during this time and then after 5 p.m. you may have some demand uh, because you know some people may be working late or some people may be working from home um, but uh, the demand uh, uh, between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m. the next day uh, is typically lower right and the pattern repeats because uh, you know every day every work day Mondays to Fridays you'll have the same pattern and then uh, maybe uh, uh, over the weekends Saturday and Sunday you'll have a lower level uh, but then the pattern starts again the next week uh, as well right so whenever you have this kind of a pattern where uh, you have uh, a regular sort of uh, um, increase in demand and, and decrease in demand and uh, also it is um, you know, predictable remember uh, in this situation uh, we know based on uh, experience uh, how much capacity right we know how many servers we need uh, during business hours and how many servers we need uh, here uh, as well right so uh, so uh, it's quite predictable uh, what kind of uh, capacity we need to set up right so uh, in this situation uh, you would not want to use manual scaling because uh, you can't have someone uh, on a daily basis at 9 a.m. changing the desired capacity and at 5 p.m. again changing the desired capacity right that would not be uh, a good way of doing this so so what we uh, uh, can can do is uh, use what are called schedule policies uh, in the auto scaling group right and um, uh, it's very very simple it takes uh, a couple of minutes to set this up and basically what we do is uh, we set up the uh, capacity uh, in such a way that um, uh, at 9 a.m. you have more capacity and then at 5 p.m. Uh, the capacity automatically is reduced in this fashion and then once again uh, the next day at 9 a.m. it increases and then uh, once again at 5 p.m. it decreases decreases I'm sorry and then uh, so on right it continues uh, for as long as you Okay, so, so this kind of thing we can easily set up and um, uh, the way to set this up is once again to uh, control the desired capacity but uh, we control that using scheduled policies right and um, uh, you know we'll see this uh, from the management console but um, in simple terms uh, all we have to do is uh, set up two rules right two policies uh, one will be the scale out uh, policy right and here we'll say something like uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, set the desired capacity to say uh, 4 right and um, we'll also create a second uh, policy let's call it the scale in policy right and that will say that at 5 p.m. set the desired capacity to a lower number let's say uh, 2 here okay so so these are uh, two um, a pair of schedule policies that we will create uh, and uh, once we do that uh, we don't really have to do anything because the auto scaling group will um, will ensure that at 9 a.m. the actual matches the desired capacity which is 4 and then uh, uh, later in the day at 5 p.m. Uh, the auto scaling group will ensure that the actual capacity matches the desired capacity which is 2 right so so um, uh, on an on a, uh, ongoing basis the auto scaling group will uh, will expand and shrink on its own uh, as soon as we set up this kind of scheduled policy okay so this is how we do scheduled uh, scaling.
The last method of scaling is uh, using auto scaling policies. So what are the criteria for uh, uh, assessing when to use uh, these policies? So first of all, um, uh, if the demand is uh, unpredictable, right? so let's say this uh, peak here, uh, we don't know uh, when it might occur or this trough here, uh, we don't know when it might occur. And uh, we also don't know uh, how much capacity we may need at a certain point in time, right? So that's uh, uh, criteria uh, number uh, one. Uh, the demand should be unpredictable, um, right? And um, the second criteria is that uh, this uh, change in uh, demand should be uh, frequent, right? If the if you have to adjust capacity frequently, we can't do we can't use manual scaling. Obviously, we have to use some sort of automated uh, scaling, uh, but uh, the change in demand should also be irregular, right? If it were to be regular, then we would use scheduled policies. But um, uh, but if the demand follows these uh, has these characteristics, unpredictable, frequent, irregular, uh, then you would want to use automatic policies, right? And the way it works is um, we set up uh, the same uh, two policies like we did uh, in scheduled policies. One policy for scale out. Right, and one for uh, scale in, uh, but here we can't use time as a uh, as a way to trigger scale out or scale in. Instead, we use something like CPU. Right, so we can say if CPU exceeds eighty percent, right, and this is a CPU of the entire uh, auto scaling group. Right, all the servers um, in aggregate. So if the CPU of the entire group exceeds eighty percent, then we change the desired capacity, right? So we don't change the actual capacity um, as, as usual. We simply uh, modify the actual capacity and we add two to whatever the desired capacity is at that time, right? So this is uh, a policy that we can configure. And uh, it's also important to have a reverse policy, right? Um, and uh, here uh, we could say if CPU is less than say 20%, uh, then we lower the desired capacity by Two servers. Okay, so we can create um, a pair of uh, auto scaling policies in this uh, fashion, and uh, then what would happen is um, the capacity would adjust automatically, right, uh, based on the CPU uh, of the group at a given point in time. Remember, you know, uh, this is unpredictable demand, right? So, so the question then becomes, how do we, how does the auto scaling group predict when to scale out and when to scale in? Um, well, the answer is that the auto scaling group doesn't know anything about the external events which may be causing the demand to change, right? But um, it does know the load. It does understand things like CPU uh, uh, or the network, um, um, the number of uh, bytes that are going in or out. So you can use uh, certain metrics uh, uh, like CPU uh, to assess, to, to estimate whether uh, the capacity has to be increased or not, right? And, um, and so uh, the capacity would uh, self-adjust something like this. Um, and um, and uh, if you set up the policies correctly, if you tune the policies correctly, and if your uh, capacity, uh, if the servers are small, then you can make frequent and uh, small adjustments to the capacity so that the capacity curve is quite close to the demand, uh, even though the demand is quite unpredictable uh, and changes uh, goes up and down quite frequently. Right. So this is how we do. Uh, automatic uh, policies and um, in the next set of videos right uh, let's take a look at uh, each of these policies one by one and uh, see how to implement uh, these policies in the AWS management console in this video let's take a look at uh, uh, how to scale the uh, group manually using the AWS management uh, console so let me switch to the uh, console here and uh, let's go over to the auto scaling group uh, page uh, where uh, let's say we have our auto scaling group already set up uh, and uh, and here notice that the desired capacity at the moment is uh, 2 and uh, naturally uh, because the auto scaling group um, always ensures actual equals desired you can see the actual number of instances is also is also uh, 2 notice also that the two servers are in two different uh, zones uh, and that's exactly how it should be the servers uh, should always be distributed in multiple zones because this is how we achieve high availability, right? Now, let's say uh, we want to uh, scale. Let's say uh, today uh, we want to do some performance test uh, on this environment and we need uh, uh, need more uh, more capacity. 
and um, uh, since it's all predictable right and we know from past experience let us say that we need to double the capacity okay so so in this uh, situation all we have to do is um, edit the uh, configuration edit the configuration of uh, the group and uh, simply change the desired capacity right so here uh, you can see the desired capacity field is set to 2 so so we simply change this and let's say we set it to 4 uh, because we need some additional capacity right uh, note that um, there are two other uh, configurations here the minimum capacity and the maximum capacity which are also currently set to 2 uh, but um, the desired capacity must always be between these two numbers including the two numbers right and um, uh, so we can't have this situation where desired is more than max so as a one time change let me set the maximum capacity to uh, 10 here right um, and so this is um, uh, all we have to to uh, to uh, scale out the the auto scaling group right let me just make this change let me click on this uh, save button here and, um, and notice now that the desired capacity becomes 4 because we just changed it but um, temporarily for a brief uh, period the actual number of instances is still 2 um, and um, uh, we know that the auto scaling group doesn't like that uh, it uh, it has detected you can see here using this uh, uh, this indication here that um, the design and the actual uh, numbers are not in sync right so it will take some action to bring the two numbers in sync and uh, you can see in the instances tab here right let me just uh, refresh this uh, a couple of times and uh, soon you can now you can see that um, the group has uh, launched two additional servers so that actual becomes equal to desired capacity right and um, uh, notice that the two servers this one here and then this one here they are both in different zones right this one is in zone 1a and the second one that is being launched is in zone 1b this is um, uh, actually very good because um, you know as we've seen earlier we always want to distribute our capacity evenly across the uh, zones that we that we are using okay this is uh, important for availability purposes so the auto scaling group is smart enough to know that and it always ensures even distribution of servers all right now one more thing i want to let you know is that when you do a scale out of the group right we don't have to do anything with the load balancer so if you look at the uh, target group that we have uh, notice that uh, in the target group the load balancers target group uh, the targets tab now has four servers right and you can see the two new servers uh, have the status initial right this one is initial and this one is initial but very soon these will change to healthy and that would mean that um, now you can see all servers are healthy and this means that uh, the two new servers have been successfully registered with the target group right and um, we don't have to do anything manually so when we scale out or scale in the auto scaling group uh, we have uh, there's no need to change anything in the target group or the load balancers configuration right and um, the application which is available uh, using the load balancers dns name keeps functioning right uh, you add more servers there's no impact uh, at all and uh, when you remove servers though uh, there could be some impact uh, uh, because when the uh, servers are removed some users who may be active on that particular server may see a slight disruption but uh, if they were to refresh the page they would be sent to some other server which is active at that time and everything would be back to normal okay so this is how manual scaling works essentially uh, change the desired capacity right by editing the auto scaling groups configuration all right so in this video let's see how to implement uh, scheduled scaling policies right and uh, let's say we have this kind of a demand chart uh, where we have a regular uh, pattern and we have a predictable uh, pattern in terms of uh, time and the number of servers so um, let's take this 9 a.m to 5 p.m example uh, say a business application which is used during office hours right and what we want to do is set up um, a pair of policies uh, these two policies right in the auto scaling group so let me show this to you let's go to the management console and uh, here is our uh, auto scaling uh, group and um, to set up scheduled policies what you do is uh, you go into this uh, tab here scheduled actions and here we will create two actions a pair one for scale out and one for scale in and there are many ways of doing this but let me show you a simple example here and uh, let's create our first action uh, and let's call it uh, 
schedule scale out policy right so here um, what we want to do is we want to set the desired capacity to say uh, four right uh, this is um, uh, the higher uh, level uh, that we want and uh, what we do is we say um, every day okay this is a simple example you can you can do more sophisticated examples as well but um, basically what we're doing here is so we're saying every day right uh, and uh, let's say starting from tomorrow uh, at 9 a.m okay at 9 a.m uh, this is in UTC, you may have to do some uh, time zone conversion, uh, but let's say we are in the UTC time zone. So uh, what's happening here is we are saying that um, every day starting from tomorrow at 9 a.m., the desired capacity for this auto scaling group will be set to 4. Okay, so, so uh, that's it. That's the uh, first of our uh, pair of policies and this one is the scale out policy. Right? And we also uh, then set the reverse policy and let's call it uh, scheduled scale in policy. Right? And here let's say we want a lower uh, capacity. This is off hours capacity and if this could be 0, uh, it could be 1 as well, it could be 2 as well. But let's say uh, we want to have a minimum of 2 servers for availability reasons and so uh, we set the desired capacity to 2. And here as well uh, this is going to be a daily change because at 5 p.m. every day, once again starting from tomorrow, uh, at 5 p.m. right every day, the desired capacity should be set to 2. Okay, so, so this is how you create a pair of scheduled actions. Uh, the first uh, action sets the desired capacity to uh, 4 at 9 a.m. every day and the second action sets the desired capacity to 2 at 5 p.m. every day. Day, right and remember uh, as usual we don't really change the actual uh, capacity uh, the actual capacity will be automatically set to the desired capacity shortly after 9 a.m. and then again shortly after 5 p.m. okay so so you can try this out and uh, and uh, see how how the scaling happens uh, when you're practicing uh, setting up the scheduled actions I will not show that to you uh, but um, what I've shown you is how to set up scheduled actions, a pair of scheduled actions uh, for uh, uh, patterns where you have regularity and predictability. Okay, so, so in the next video, let's see how to scale using automatic auto-scaled policies as well. All right, so in this final uh, video, in this module, let's take a look at how to uh, scale the group using auto-scaling policies, right? And uh, basically remember, uh, we use these policies when uh, the usage pattern, the demand is unpredictable, it's frequently changing, and uh, there's no regular uh, uh, usage pattern, right? It's, uh, it's unpredictable, irregular. And um, we want to set up, uh, once again, a pair of policies, one for scale out and one for scale in. And we will use the CPU metric, right? The CPU uh, of the auto scaling group as a way to uh, trigger uh, scale out or scale in. Let's see how to do this in the management console. All right, so here's our um, auto scaling group, right? And, um, and uh, we want to set up uh, dynamic policies. Um, and what you need to do is go into this tab here, scaling policies. Okay, so, so um, here we can add uh, our pair of policies and uh, let's add the first one, which is the scale out policy. So, so here, yeah, let me call it uh, auto scale out policy. Okay, this is the name of the policy. And um, let's say we are, again, there are many ways of doing this. Uh, let me show you a simple example. And um, what we will do is um, uh, create something called an alarm first, right? The alarm is actually uh, part of the CloudWatch service. CloudWatch is the monitoring service and um, the CPU metric that we use for triggering the scale out or scale in uh, actually comes from the CloudWatch service, right? But um, basically what we uh, are doing here is creating the condition for scale out, right? We are, are, are specifying the conditions under which the scale out operation should occur. and um, we could say something like uh, if average CPU, right, if uh, the average CPU of the entire auto scaling group uh, and um, uh, the group could be dozens of servers, right, so, so it's the aggregate and the average CPU of the entire group um, and if the CPU uh, is say more than 80%, right, if the CPU is more than 80%, uh, also if it is more than 80% for say 5 consecutive minutes. Right, this is the kind of condition you need to uh, create and, uh, and you may have to fine-tune these conditions um, uh, in the real world over time as well. 
but uh, uh, it makes sense to to check the uh, CPU utilization for a longish period, say five minutes, because you know 80% utilization is normal, it's fine. But um, if um, the CPU is at 80% for a prolonged period, right, then uh, maybe you can say that uh, you know there is a bit of an overload uh, situation. Okay, so so you need to have some length of time, uh, and uh, here basically uh, we are saying that if CPU is more than 80% for five minutes. Right, uh, and um, this is our condition. Right, this is our condition for scale out, and uh, then we say that uh, if this condition is met, then we will add two servers. Right, uh, note that we are adding two servers to whatever number of servers we already have. Right, so two is not an absolute number; it's a relative number, and we are trying to increase the capacity by two if the uh, CPU utilization is 80% for the last five minutes. Okay, this is our uh, first of two auto scaling policies. Okay, all right, now let's add the second policy as well. We always need the uh, scale in policy also because this is the one that uh, reduces the number of servers and keeps the cost of our infrastructure in control. And here as well, uh, we will set up an alarm, a different alarm. And um, uh, here we'll have uh, this kind of condition where we say, if the CPU of the entire auto scaling group uh, at an aggregate level falls below 20%, right? Below 20%, let's say, and if it stays below 20% for say 10 minutes, right? Or even more, let's say 15 minutes. Okay, you need to be, um, you need to have a longer uh, period to test if the demand has subsided, right? Because you have to be um, a conservative when you're removing servers. And you can be more aggressive when you're adding servers, but but when you're removing servers, uh, you don't want to be in a situation where you remove servers and then immediately after that the demand increases and then you have a problem with performance or you have an outage, right? So, so you have to be conservative and that's why we have a longer period here to test if we should be removing servers or not, right? And remember, you can always fine-tune this based on what you see on the ground. All right, so that's our condition under which we want to scale in here. And what we do here is we say, if CPU is below 20% for 15 minutes, then remove two servers, all right? Okay, so this is how we create a pair of auto-scaling policies. And uh, once we uh, do this, then the group will automatically adjust the capacity, right? Just like you're seeing here uh, in, the, in the chart here, right? So, so let's say, uh, the capacity is over here. It sees a bit of a uh, uh, increase in the load, right? The CPU goes above 80% for five minutes, so it adds two servers. Okay, so it adds two servers here. It adds two servers here. Um, then here, it sees a decline in the uh, utilization, so it removes two servers here. Okay, once again, it adds two servers here, adds two servers here. So you see, the scale out can happen multiple times. It's not a one-time event. Um, if the CPU is over 80%, it scales out. And then again, it checks again after some time. If the CPU is still over 80%, it adds two more, adds two more, adds two more, and so on, okay? And then here, uh, you can see it can remove servers multiple times, right? So it removes servers uh, uh, here, then again here, then again here, once again here, once again here. So it can go up, 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 uh, down, 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 up, down, up, down, right? All those uh, kinds of changes are possible. Uh, depending on the situation on the ground, right? What's happening with your infrastructure? All right, now here, you know, also note that we have uh, the min and the max, right? So this is very important to uh, know that uh, we have a min, let's say, or rather a max uh, set to some number, right? And we also have a min set to some number. So, so at the moment, um, we have the max set to uh, 10, right, max is set to 10, and the min is set to 2, okay, this is very important when we use auto scaling policies, because uh, we don't want our auto scaling group to go crazy, right, and, uh, and uh, increase the number of servers uh, in an uncontrolled fashion, and uh, uh, without you becoming aware of it, and then you may find a very large bill, right, so, uh, and, and in, the, in the same way, uh, we don't want the uh, uh, the scale in to happen in such a way that you're left with uh, no servers or you're left with uh, very few servers and then you have performance problems or you have 
uh, outages, right? So these are the max and the min are uh, especially important when it comes to auto scaling policies, and uh, these um, uh, protect us, right? They protect us from cost issues and they protect us from availability issues, right? So you can see here that in our uh, uh, auto scaling group, uh, even though we have these two scaling policies, uh, we still have the minimum and the maximum, right? And these are uh, to be configured correctly and you have to think about these because uh, let's say you have a very low max number, right? Uh, then um, the auto scaling group will not go beyond that and uh, that max number may be too low and then your demand may be higher uh, than the max capacity and then you may end up with an outage, right? So you have to uh, not just configure these two scaling policies, right? You also have to carefully consider and configure the minimum and maximum uh, configurations as well, okay? All right, so uh, here uh, in this uh, last video, in this module, uh, we have seen how to set up the auto scaling policies. All right, so that um, concludes this module. And uh, in the next module, let's see how to clean up the resources uh, that we have uh, provisioned in this course. So in this uh, last module and last video of this uh, course, let's take a look at how to clean up the resources that we have um, uh, used in this course. So remember, uh, there's a bunch of things here, uh, things like uh, the uh, load balancer itself uh, to the auto scaling group uh, and the underlying servers that it has um, uh, and some configurations like the launch configuration or the target group configuration, uh, also the uh, default uh, VPC that we've used. Uh, and the default security group that we've used as well, right? And the important thing to note is that these two have some cost associated with them, right? And these are uh, two components in this architecture that you must terminate, right? Not only when you uh, finish the course, but uh, you may need to terminate these multiple times uh, because you may do the course over multiple days, Right? So once you finish uh, practice on a, on a given day, make sure that you terminate these two resources so that you're not built for, uh, for these resources when you're not practicing. And the next day, you can provision these resources once again. Okay? So these two are the most important uh, things to uh, clean up. Uh, and then um, if you like, uh, the launch configuration, the target group, these are just configurations. There's no cost of these. Um, right? And uh, you can keep them around uh, as long as you find them useful. Okay? And um, these two, the VPC and the security group, uh, we use the default um, uh, VPC and the, and, and the group. And uh, these also have no cost and you must not delete them because these are useful for, these will be useful to you for other projects as well. Okay, so, so don't delete these uh, and uh, definitely delete uh, this one. Okay, so this one, these two must be deleted. Uh, this one, you can keep them around and these ones you must keep, you must not remove. All right, so let me just uh, show this to you. Let me show you how to uh, do the cleanup. So here's our management console. And in the dashboard, notice that um, you can see uh, two instances. These are the two instances of the auto scaling group. And you can also see one load balancer, right? And uh, you can see two volumes as well. These are two EBS volumes uh, attached to the two servers that we have, right? So once you do the cleanup, you can verify from the dashboard that these resources, instances, volumes, and load balances are um, at, at zero value, okay? All right, so let's see how to first remove the load balancer. And um, all we do is uh, go to the load balancers page, select the load balancer, and from actions, delete it, right? That's it. And then um, we go to the auto scaling group um, page, find the group, select it, and then from actions, delete that as well, right? And um, it'll take a bit of time for the uh, two instances, the underlying instances to be removed. So if you look at the dashboard, right, you can see that, um, you know, the load balancer number has gone to zero, which is good, but the instances number is still at two and the volumes number is still at two. So it'll take a bit of time for these two becomes, you know, to go to zero, but uh, you can uh, come back to this page and verify that uh, that has indeed happened. All right, okay, so, so, this is how you clean up uh, the load balancer and the auto scaling group, which is the most important uh, thing to uh, do here. All right, now, um, if you like, you can keep the launch configuration and the target group around, right? You should do that, especially if you're practicing this course over multiple days. Uh, but uh, if you want to clean this up, right, this is how you do it. Uh, you go into the um, target group page, let's say, right? Here's your, uh, here's the target group, and you simply select that 
and uh, from actions delete the group and then uh, similarly you go to the launch configurations page and uh, and uh, uh, select that and from actions delete that as well okay so this is how you clean up uh, these two components uh, make sure that you don't delete the default security group right this should not be uh, done at all because it will be useful for you for other uh, types of uh, work right although there's an option here do not delete it and then uh, the VPC uh, you should not be deleting but uh, in any case there's no option to delete that uh, uh, in the EC2 management console all right okay folks so uh, uh, this is um, the, the video where we have seen how to clean up the resources and uh, this brings us uh, to an end uh, of this module and of this course I hope you uh, found this course uh, 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 useful. Thank you.